On the show, in Wheelspin, we drive the recently launched Fiat Aventura. In Wheelspin, we also ride the Triumph Daytona 675R. And on the road, we drive the Hyundai Verna from Jodhpur to Jaisalmer. What I have with me is the latest from Fiat, the Fiat Aventura. One look at it and you start wondering whether this is a full-blown sedan or an SUV. A question that I've been asked ever since I started driving it. The answer to that is that this is what is called in automotive parlance a crossover. Part sedan, part SUV. But now the big question is how well does she do the job of either? Let's find out. Fiat is on a comeback trail in India and it's evident by the number of launches they have had this year. Starting with a refurbished Linea in the beginning of the year, they followed it up with the updated Punto, the Punto Evo recently and now the brand new Aventura to add to their product portfolio. So how new is the Aventura? Aventura here is based on another Fiat product, the Punto Evo, which was launched very, very recently. And that's the reason why you see so many similarities, including this reindeer headlamp here. And under the skin too, things are very identical, including the power plant here, which is shared by both the Punto as well as this Aventura here. And many of the mechanical aggregates are same as well. But that's where the similarity ends, because the Aventura is positioned completely differently. It's a car which is meant to take you outdoors as well as drive you within the city. Platform sharing is a rather clever thing that most manufacturers practice as it helps bring down both the cost as well as the time for development. And in Fiat's case too, this is what has helped the Aventura to come to life. But a very different body style helps it to cater to a new lifestyle segment, which encourages a completely different set of customers to acquire the Aventura, which certainly looks more adventurous and unconventional than a basic sedan or a hatch. And if the Aventura does succeed, then it will certainly create a new sub-segment in the Indian market. The Aventura 2 would be sold with both the diesel and the petrol engines and what I'm driving today is a reliable, trusted 1.3-litre multi-jet from Fiat which is doing duty on many cars across India and with many brands. The good part about this 1.3-litre multi-jet is that this is not only a very reliable engine but it's also very fuel efficient. The fuel efficiency rate according to ARI certification is about 20.5 kilometres to a litre and that's not bad. And on top of that, the power delivery is very, very linear, churns out about 200 newton meters of torque. And this torque is very good for city driving as well as if you were to ever take this car off the road. Where the Aventura really stands differentiated from other products, especially the sedans, is in the fact that it comes with a very high crown clearance of about 205 millimeters, which means that the pothole should never bother you, and if you do ever decide to go off the road, then it shouldn't be a problem. In terms of ride and handling, the Aventura is quite sorted out. In fact, it's quite comfortable even in the back seat, while as if you spend time on the driver's seat, you will be rewarded with nice cornering abilities in this car and the 16-inch wheels ensure that it stays planted very well. Both the petrol and the diesel engines are 16-valve DOHC units which churn out a peak power of 90 PS and 93 PS respectively. And the 1.4-litre petrol unit has an ARI certified fuel efficiency of 14.4 km to a litre. The interiors of the Aventura, like most of the Fiat products, is quite solidly built and gives you a nice reassuring feel. What I'm driving is the top trim and this comes with all the frills you will associate with the top trim, including a leather-wrapped steering wheel and leather-wrapped gear shift lever plus two airbags. But the pity is that only the top trim gets airbags and there is nothing available for the lower two trims. 
and I just can't help emphasizing that a poor man needs as much safety as a rich man. So there should have been an option at least of an airbag in the lower trim. But then to compensate for the lack of safety equipment, the Aventura has a host of features which are standard across the trims like the follow me headlamps which switch off after a preset time and lights up your way in the dark, a rather useful feature. 16 inch alloy wheels, dual tone dashboard tilt adjustable steering wheel which is adjustable only for height and not for reach and a stylish roof rack which will allow you to carry your bicycles. And all these features does make the Aventura a lot more user friendly. But what doesn't really help is the lack of electrically folding outside rear view mirrors even in the top trim. The Aventura is rather compact and also narrow and where this narrow becomes a problem is when you sit in the driver's seat and you look at the tunnel here. Fiat has done well to give you a dead pedal but the problem is that being narrow it kind of fouls up with the clutch pedal and it will become a problem especially if you have a big feet. And then I am surprised to find something in a car specifically designed for India which doesn't really work. The door pockets have a water bottle holder but this is so narrow that you can't really keep a full 1 litre water bottle and that I think is a bit of a problem again because in India we do like to carry big water bottles and Fiat in an effort to make the interiors a little more appealing have added on some instrumentation here which basically includes a compass and what they call an inclinometer to make it a little more appealing to the adventure junkies but the fact is this is completely redundant and it's done badly it looks like a bad aftermarket job and in these days of GPS who really needs a compass. The Aventura does pack in a lot of very useful features even in the base trim but derived out of a hatch with only 2.5 meters of wheelbase. The big question is does it provide enough space for the rear seats? In terms of rear seat space, the Aventura is a bit tight, although the seats are comfortable and well cushioned, but there's hardly any knee room as you can see here. And if you were to put a third person on the third row of seats, things will get very tight. But the good part is that the seats do fold down. So in case you want to carry that extra bit of luggage, this is going to come in handy. And now it's time for me to walk outside and open the hatch and see what it looks like. What gives the Aventura a somewhat different look at least from the rear is the mounting of the Stepney here which is mounted on the tailgate and this is what gives the Aventura a somewhat SUV like rough and tough appearance and this opens in a rather unconventional way. First you move this out and then you open the hatch and once you open the hatch you will be surprised to find that there is plenty of space to carry your weekend getaway stuff. The good part is that the Aventura is packaged rather well and the price point is competitive with medium sized hatchbacks and entry level sedans as it starts at Rs 5.99 lakhs for the base petrol. And if you compare the features with any base trim you will find that the Aventura has more features to talk about than its competitors and this is what makes it a deal. Plus the fact that it has three trims on offer for both the petrol and the diesel and this does increase your choice. So overall as a complete package the Aventura is sure attractive, more so as it provides a completely different option to buying a regular car. If by launching the Aventura Fiat had planned on giving you an alternative to buying a regular hatchback or a sedan then I think they have succeeded to an extent because the Aventura with its different body style and a high ground clearance does offer an alternative. So if you are sitting on the fence in between choosing a SUV or a regular hatchback or a sedan then you would do well to have a look at this Aventura because it does provide an alternative. Triumph has been offering a rather large portfolio for the Indian market which includes a retro style motorcycle like the Bonneville, a cafe racer Thruxton and even a big cruiser like the Thunderbird LT. But what I have with me today sticks out actually because this is the only sports bike they are offering 
in the Indian market. The Daytona 675. And one look at it and you know this is a full-blooded sports bike. In fact, I would call it a hyper sports bike. The Triumph Daytona is one of the relatively small sports bikes available in the Indian market in terms of engine capacity and dimensions. And this is what perhaps makes it so suitable for our Indian roads because it's easy to weave in and out of city traffic and also quite light to handle. But it looks the part as a sports bike with its attractive styling. Why I called it the Hyper Sports Bike is very simple because I've been riding it for a while. And if you ride this bike, you know what this bike is capable of. This is a small bike as compared to super bikes. The motor is only 675 cc, but it churns out 126 brake horsepower. And mind you, this is mounted on a very light chassis, which weighs just around 180 kilos. And that is what makes this bike so very dynamic, so very agile, and you can really throw her around the corners. And in fact, if you're caught in city traffic, no problem. The bike really goes through city traffic. In fact, it cuts through city traffic. And in the open stretch, this bike can take you to speeds which are completely, completely illegal. It might be small in size, but it more than makes up for this lack of size with its spirited performance. With a motor that is easy to rev and it goes all the way to the 15,000 red line without much hesitation. And the six-speed gearbox is easy to shift and even easier to find the neutral in when driving in stop-and-go city traffic. And the Brembo brakes equipped with ABS do a very capable job of stopping the bike. In terms of styling, this is a proper sports bike. Low crouch riding position with clip-on handlebars, fairings, a short visor here. And if you're of light build, you can tuck yourself behind the visor and make things really aerodynamic. But in terms of size, this is rather compact, it's rather lightweight, and it's far less intimidating than a big full-blown superbike. But in terms of rideability, it's no less. In fact, if you happen to take this bike on a racetrack, you will find that out for yourself. You will get timings you won't be ashamed of. Because this is one bike you can throw around corners and she corners indeed very, very well. And I rather like the angry, throaty exhaust note of the short exhaust. Eggs you on every time you twist the throttle to go faster and faster. <laughs> The instrumentation is basic, but it does give you the information you might need. Although a larger lettering would certainly help as it becomes much easier to read at higher speeds and consequently makes it much safer as you have to take your eyes off the road for much less time. What I'm riding today is the Daytona 675 with an R. And you might as well ask, what's the big deal about the R? And I can tell you, apart from small cosmetic differences like the red paint job here and a touch of carbon fiber, the big deal is that she rides on Olin shock absorbers instead of the standard Showa. And this is what makes this R the preferred bike for the big boys because she corners really hard with the Olins. The difference in terms of pricing between the R and the regular Daytona is around Rs 1.5 lakhs. And if you are a hard rider, then you will easily justify this price difference. Because with a harder suspension setup, the Daytona R becomes a much better handler and a lot more fun to ride. Other than this, everything else remains the same except the weight which has gone down by a few kilograms in the R. After riding the Daytona 675R for a while, all I can tell you is that if you're not the kind of a guy who's stuck on a superbike, then you would do very well to have a look at this one because this is a bike here which does everything just as well as any superbike would, except for the fact that she is not that fast. But then she compensates by cornering extremely well. Plus, she looks good and is not as obscenely priced as other superbikes are. The Daytona 675 ABS is priced at Rs 10.3 lakhs. 
while as the Daytona 675R that we rode is priced at Rs 11.75 lakh. And for a small 675cc motorcycle, this may seem a bit on the higher side, but the immaculate build quality with an eager responsive engine makes it an attractive proposition. Time for me to get going again and as I told you last week, today I'm off to Jaisalmer, the city of the Golden Fort. Now I'm told that the stretch of road from Jodhpur to Jaisalmer is just excellent. There's hardly any traffic and the road is straight so this should be a fun drive. Of course I have my beautiful Hyundai Verna to take me there so I'm looking forward to getting behind the wheel. Now the Verna comes in both a petrol and diesel version, but I'm driving the diesel, not that you can tell from the driver's seat. The engine is pretty powerful, there's 128 horses under the bonnet and they're eagerly responding to the throttle. It's also a good car in terms of handling, especially after the company made some changes to the current generation Verna in terms of its suspension. So it's a great ride with good handling and really, really comfortable. In fact, I wonder whether any other car in this category combines drivability, comfort and features quite as well as this one does. What makes the Verna really easy to drive on a long trip are the features. In this department, it's called Full Marks. It has these multi-function buttons on the steering wheel, climate control, which is great for the desert heat, the sunglass holder, which I think is just such a nifty addition, and a cooled glove box. I think it's everything you need for a road trip. The drive from Jodhpur to Jaisalmer, a distance of 278 kilometers, takes around four and a half hours to complete via MDR32 and NH15. The stunning views of the desert make you almost wish that the drive was longer. Just be sure to carry lots of water with you because the dry desert air can leave you parched. I'm almost there now and I'm looking forward to checking out the Jaisalmer Fort. Jaisalmer Fort emerges like a sandcastle out of the desert. It's almost like you're seeing a mirage. Now this fort was built in the 12th century by the Rajput ruler Rawal Jaisal and it's after him that the city gets its name, Jaisalmer. It was this fort that was also featured in the Satyajit Ray film Shonar Kela which alludes to this very fort, the Golden Fort. And a very interesting part of the fort are the Jain temples in the back. They're really intricate and definitely worth a visit. Don't forget to peek into the Parsvanath temple dedicated to the 22nd Tirthankara with its ornate ceiling which has a sculpture of a demon-like head with four bodies arranged in a circle. As you walk around, the head seems to connect to each of the bodies. The architecture and carving is unusual and worth observing closely. in Jaisalmer, I came straight here to the Golden Fort. And that does seem to be what everyone who's visiting is doing because it's teeming with tourists. But I haven't actually seen any of the town yet, so it's time for me to get back in the car and drive around some more. Let's go.
strolling around Jaisalmer, you're very likely to encounter some charming architecture. The city is dotted with ornate havelis, and I've actually chanced upon Patoki Haveli. And its beautiful airy courtyards and carved wooden ceilings and balconies just transport you to a bygone era of luxury and romance. Patwonki Haveli is a set of five houses wedged into a narrow street, built by five Jain brothers who traded in brocade in the centuries past. The first house comprises a quaint museum showcasing old artifacts, furniture and textile, all representative of Rajasthan's history and traditions. I have to admit that in the middle of the day, it is so hot in Jaisalmer. So the shade of these Havelis has been such a welcome break from all the sightseeing. But now I'm ready to go check out Garisar Lake. So I'm off. Walking along the Garisar Lake makes you feel like you've entered a postcard. Its cool waters lap the honey-coloured shrines on its banks and it's just picture perfect. Now I believe it's a tradition here to feed the hundreds of catfish that live in the lake. So I'm going to go see what it's like. They're looking a bit slimy to me but everyone seems to be throwing bread into the water. So let's go check it out. The Garisar Lake was built in the 12th century by a visionary king who wanted to conserve and channel rainwater given the harsh dry climate. Until only a few decades ago, it was Jaisalmer's only water supply. Now it's a popular spot for recreation, bird watching, and apparently for feeding catfish. After walking around here, I'm tempted to go and buy some of the souvenirs I saw on my way. I think there's puppets and musical instruments and all kinds of local Rajasthani things. So I'm going to go see what there is. When shopping for souvenirs, you'll find that Jaisalmer is a riot of craft and colour and has something for everyone. There are shops that sell everything from puppets and musical instruments to turbans in bright shades like vermilion and yellow. You're sure to find something unusual to take back with you and you'll probably even find a local folk musician or two strumming a beautiful tune. It's almost time for me to head back to Jodhpur to get my flight to Mumbai but before I leave I thought I'd stop by the Sam sand dunes to get a sense of the vastness of the Thar Desert. Jaisalmer's location is incredible. It's situated right at the edge of the Thar Desert. Now I've come to the Sam Sand Dune to take in the vastness of the Thar. Here, everywhere you look, all you see are golden sand dunes. It's really magical, especially at sunset. After a long and eventful day in Jaisalmer, it's time for me to head back. Now no tour vendor managed to convince me to trade in my trusty Verna for a camel, although they tried really hard. Nothing beats a speed so smooth, and in the desert heat, the air conditioning feels like heaven. Well, I better get going, but do tune in again next week for some more road trip inspiration.